first, I want to say thank you to all of you for all of your hard work on this uh, area. You're studying, you're doing some deep thinking. So we hope that the presentation kind of moves forward your thinking um, through very specifically a race equity lens. Uh, myself and Rebecca have worked on this uh, campaign, if you will, some research, some policy recommendations. But there's also a whole group of actually black scholars that help guide this work. Um, and you, if you have our brief, you can see their names. So I would never take credit for those PhDers. That's a lot of long hours and personal sacrifice as African Americans to carry on the legacy of their ancestors in terms of social change in this country. So I always want to honor that. Um, but I'm going to give a little quick intro uh, to about the presentation. And then also, you're going to hear a big commercial about Manip. Um, so I do a little bit more than just race equity plans. And the organization is really committed to a race equity lens in education. Um, and so I hope you, you take that, uh, like I said, as a commercial. But it really will let you know that multiple campaigns that are going on frankly, in this country and globally, to reform education from a very uh, a white ideology to centering people of color in our histories in education. So I'm excited to share with you that. Um, but then we will get into the brief of some data that I think is really important. Uh, first of all, the Minnesota Education Equity Partnership, we've been around for about 30 years. Started in this state in the 80s through a founder, uh, Ron McKinley, who's a Native American uh, educator. Uh, and definitely an activist around this topic of students of color and access to education. Uh, our current mission right now is, again, back to uh, after, everyone knows things got a little tense in this country after 2016 uh, to talk about race. Uh, but prior to that, we, we really looked at the data we heard from community and we said we have to lift up this term race equity, which is some of the definition I will share with you. Um, so Manip actually uses a race equity lens to transform educational institutions, organizations, and our leaders to uplift students of color success and Native American students. We identify Native Americans separately because of their history, the sovereignty that they have with this state, with this nation. And so we hope that as you, you go along in your work, you always ask the question, and what about our Native American brothers and sisters? That's vitally important because they have a different relationship. This is their land. We are on Lakota land. What kind of society do we envision? I think this is very important to any social change. Before you get into the policies and the recommendations, you really have to look at your vision, right? We want a just society with equitable educational ecosystem. An ecosystem means it's not just the school buildings. It's not just um, you know, your professors and who you're training. It's the entire system. It's how our parents are supported. It's how their local parks are open or accessible to all of our children, right? Education is every day. Education is a parent talking to a child at home. But if their lights don't work, and if funding hasn't come through for them to have good housing, they can't be part of that ecosystem. So we envision uh, this future where everything's working together in tandem with, with this race equity lens especially. And lastly, we also know that race should no longer be a predictor of success. That's why we're all here, right? We disproportionately have certain groups of people in lower economic standing, lower education standing, because of systemic barriers, because of racism. So, so our vision is something different. These are actual real graduations and African-American young men with our previous president, which just shows you that the talent is there. It's so exciting. If I had two hours with you, I would go through all my slides of all the amazing people of color uh, that we have to really unpack what opportunities they got and how our systems can change that so we create more of that success. But I don't have that much time with you, but I know you all know them. You can think of them right now. So here's our definition, which is critically important. We say that, the race, equ that race equity is not the achievement gap. The achievement gap is just capturing one moment in time and differences in educational outcomes. It also means, eventually, race equity, that those who are most impacted by disparities need to be part of the solution. And lastly, equity is raising the achievement of all students. So people actually think, oh, equity, people who want to be divisive, they say, that's just about those kids. Well, what about our kids? It's typically uh, a debate, black and white. Really, once you address those dis disproportionalities, you're making the system better for all students. If we had multilingualism in all the schools, all of our children would be multilingual. So right now, we need accessibility to our, for our EL learners. I'm just bringing that up as an example. But we also know that there are amazing school environments, even here in Minnesota, with dual immersion programs, where your white children are learning Spanish, your Spanish-speaking children are getting better in their Spanish and learning English. Same thing for all the other languages represented. So we have to just think holistically and start to message this, especially to white families, that this is about both and. And uh, I don't know, if, can you raise your hand if you've all heard about a race equity lens, how to use a race equity lens? There's a few people. This will start to emerge more and more in, um, in all of our public institutions. I think it's super important for uh, people to come out of the university, but especially with community advocates, to understand what this means. 
it means that you're actually looking at something in new ways, in new revealing ways. And so this is a great uh, piece, actually, I want to reference National Equity Project, provides this uh, diagram. A race equity lens means you're going to look at data, you're going to look at a situation and start to ask critical questions about the policies, those outcomes, power relationships, and what those possible solutions could be. Back to the Manip definition that do we have people of color? Do we have, if women are underserved in a profession, are they involved in the solutions? So that's your new lens. Otherwise, it becomes very much blame the victim, right? We have disproportionality in special ed because those kids don't behave. Well, who are those kids? You know, I'll give you more. I'm going to back up even more into the history in this country of, of actually targeting children and, and making black and brown, especially young men, uh, that quote unquote predator. So all those narratives matter. We, we look at data and we come to a conclusion about those individuals rather than the system. This is a commercial time. So our fig, five big bold goals that the organization focuses on, I just told you a little bit about how we look at race equity, how we look at education. But we do have five major campaigns that we're working on right now. We have a brochure that you could take with you to, to uh, get more involved. Um, I'll quickly say that the first one is uh, working on leading with an equity lens, as we said. But, but using that work specifically with superintendents. So we're starting with a superintendent cohort in this state, which has never been done before. We partnered with Mankato State University to um, invite folks in who they, they are self-selecting, and they say they want to kind of unpack their history with race. Quite frankly, that could be um, predominantly white superintendents when you look at the demographics of the state. So it's been very interesting and very, um, I've been very humbled to hear their conversations about a little bit of their personal journey with race which again is not any one person's fault. Uh, it's, a, it's a country that really lifted up certain people's voices and certain genders in decision making. And so when people always hear that, um, they rarely think, hmm, I should listen to a Latina around education, or I should listen to somebody with a disability around this. They have a certain um, dominance, right, in this, in this conversation. So our leading with an equity lens uh, in portfolio one is really superintendents, uh, we do school board trainings, and we're trying to have more leaders really reflect on their own journey and then systems. Our second area we'll talk about is the school climate work. Third is that we have a huge campaign to change the teacher demographics in Minnesota. Um, that's going on nationally. Nationally, there's only about 18% uh, teachers of color. In this state, it's only been like 5%, and it's not even shifting. So we're looking at a big systems change uh, policy plan with our organization. We constantly partner with others. So this isn't just a little shop trying to change the world. We are partnering with teachers, teacher education programs with the state and others to do that change. And then we're working with uh, the topic of emerging multilingual learners, so English learners, and hoping to get more policy and practice in place for their equ equity in their education. And last, we have a brief coming up. Um, hopefully, you'll look at our website uh, in about, hopefully, 72 hours, if they texted me right, uh, where we'll have a college access brief, look at uh, uh, the, his the history of race equity and higher ed, higher ed policy, but very specifically financial aid policy. So we're trying to get more equi equitable outcomes in uh, finance, fa financing uh, higher education. Okay, so many of you got the brief. Um, I'm going to kind of dip here into our, our work and why this issue is so critical. Uh, when we started looking at this data, it was actually back with just Minneapolis public schools showing us the over suspension rates of African American young children as early as 03, 05, around that period of time. Um, but more recently, this report that we we're saying you all have. Uh, you all have access to it, is showing us the disproportionality in terms of um, when our, our student population is a certain percentage, but we're seeing huge, huge disciplinary uh, incidences reported. So while our African-American students only represent 12% of the Minnesota student population, they are 42% of those incidents. American Indian students make up 2% of our population, but 8% of those reported incidences of discipline. And this discipline here is, is broad. I'll get more into special ed and discipline. And then while our white students are 69% of the population, they are actually accounted for 38% of those disciplinary actions. And again, specifically we talked to the, the previous speakers talking about special education, but we're seeing a racial uh, disparity there. Back to the African American population, 12% of our state but they represent 17% of those classified with special education. And when we break that down, our concern is that uh, there is uh, certain categories that they're overly reported in, they're, they're um, represented in. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. 
our Latino students represent 9% of the state, but they're making up 15% of the special education uh, population. So these are the categories that we're concerned about. This is where I know um, Rebecca will fill in a bit more about why this is problematic, but I'll just show you the data. In terms of the EBD classification, so raise your hand if you've unpacked a little bit more about this uh, classification of special education. While African American and American Indian students um, are actually highly disproportionately represented in that setting, and that's what's critically important here. Um, they'll account for, unfortunately, almost half of the students in restrictive procedures. So when, if they're in EBD, they're 55% of, uh, in that restrictive procedure category. And back to black students making up 12% of the population, but they're making up 18% of all those EBD referrals. So this is our concern, that disproportionality. And what is the result in terms of graduation rates? We're seeing our uh, special ed students definitely not graduating at the rate of our general ed students. Uh, which is not good in terms of how are we going to graduate more students of color, and then especially students of color with that special ed are uh, not, graduation, not graduating at a high enough rate. So our not climate, our school climate network, um, is really working on different aspects of this issue. With the research that we've done, we started back in 08 uh, through 2012, just looking at what's going on around the country. What are they saying about this issue? Uh, we've convened activists, we've convened policymakers to talk about solutions, and we've provided actual technical assistance to school districts. One exciting piece was um, back around 2015, 2016, we were very involved on, on a national network uh, with the ESSA, with the uh, reauthorization of ESSA, the state plans that we have to produce and show the federal government. Uh, we were also involved in how could behavior, how could suspension rate issues be addressed through that, those plans. And this is some of our impact. Uh, with Minneapolis Public Schools, we actually work with them uh, to look at a policy shift in um, how they were dealing with suspensions of early grades. So we got to advise the superintendent there to uh, stop early grade suspensions. That was exciting. We also took a look at uh, their language also in terms of behavior code language. Secondly, this launching of a coalition. So now around the nation, there are different coalitions that are dealing with um, the issue calling it solutions, not suspensions. So we were the of the group that founded the original uh, Minnesota Solutions Not Suspensions campaign, which is still going. And then last, we have um, actually ad addressed legislative uh, language with regards to student inclusion and engagement. So it's called the Student Inclusion and Engagement Act, uh, aiming for changes in the laws to address very subjective discretion in terms of classroom dismissals. So some of that specific language. So we're jumping back to a little bit of more framework for you all about the history and where these uh, systemic inequalities stem from. I think this is very clear that um, when you see these systemic issues, we have, have to understand that US policy was very explicit about excluding our students of color from education in this country. This should also take about a semester to fully understand, and I'm gonna do it in one slide. But I, I'm highlighting how three populations throughout time uh, were actually, uh, there were actually explicit policies, right, to exclude them from opportunity. With African American children from uh, the history of slavery and banning reading uh, and learning for uh, slaves, African American slaves, um, we note that this is kind of the start of excluding African Americans from, from education in this country. And then also through the Jim Crow era, um, I think one very fascinating piece of, um, knowledge, uh, Michelle Alexander's book around the new Jim Crow uh, discusses that a lot of historians don't have one date where Jim Crow actually ended in this country. That if you look at the criminal justice system, education and other places, you still have these exclusionary practices and policies. Could be small p, but we are still impacting people as we did back in the day when people were physically uh, kept from voting or physically kept from schools. We do it in other ways, so Jim Crow continues. And then for Latino children, um, in terms of barring language, uh, that has been going on for a long time. And many of you know, if you're of background of German descent or um, from European countries, that this, this country was also not very happy about you all keeping your languages. And so definitely with the rise of the Latino population, there have been um, Prop uh, 187, other efforts around the country to bar um, being bilingual and, and learning more, um, more Spanish. <laughs> 
And then lastly, the American Indian, the history of American Indian students and the uh, boarding school era. And that's deeply impactful, especially in Minnesota. Um, I, I, we still work in coalition with some families that have grandparents that were barred from learning their languages and uh, barred from celebrating their traditions and cultures because of that era of uh, excluding American Indians from their own identity development. And I was very explicit as far as uh, trying to create a more white supremacist um, you know, notion of what this country would look like. And, and that, that's how Native Americans have suffered through exclusionary and very harsh policy. So a term we use that I think is really important, um, and it's uh, based out of Gloria Ladson Billings' work as an education researcher, is the education debt. So you've been hearing these different terms. We have an achievement gap that a lot of uh, politicians and others want to say, you know, oh, if those parents just cared more about education, you know, they'd close that gap, but it's actually systemic, so we know those are opportunity gaps. But then the origins of all of that is an education debt. It is that which was held back from, was, was, was withdrawn from communities of color in order for them to develop talents. I think that's really important in these conversations. Every school district can ask, what could possibly be the education debt of these, these uh, outcomes? What are the origins of these um, disparate outcomes? I've yet to hear a school board member use the term, but that's what we're trying to do. And then, um, before we get to the meat of the, the work in terms of using a critical race theory to look at um, the discipline gaps and Rebecca's amazing work, I wanted to show you some points of history, especially through the 80s, uh, that really started to get harsher on students in terms of uh, their behaviors. And it really is aligned with this, this era of treating minority youth, I don't like to use the term minority, but this is from the quote, um, in the inner cities, people felt this pressure to treat them like adults. So I hope you've all seen the um, amazing film by Ava DuVernay, When They See Us, about the criminalization of youth in New York, um, who were eventually ex exonerated. Those, those African-American young men uh, are, are an important example of this era, which is that young men were treated like villains. They didn't have any sort of rights um, in terms of hearing them out or just uh, due process, but quickly were assumed to be the criminals in that situation. So that's, that's a key part of this history. There was a real clamp down here about um, drug-free schools, policies around safe and gun-free, um, the, the Safe and Gun-Free Schools Act of 1994, which was mandating a one-year expulsion for any student that brought a, a firearm to school. And there's a lot of literature that's now showing um, how disproportionately uh, students of color were treated with those kind of policies, where um, there was just no questions asked, you're out, you know, and then that led to horrible um, pathway right to the prison system. So this is where we start the school to prison pipeline uh, that everyone talks about. If you look through um, newspapers or other articles during this time, criminologists uh, start to build a narrative of black and Latino predators, and uh, often used even in political elections, so that you're framing up, you know, these people are guilty before, um, before anything else. So I'll localize it, I'll go back to the other slide, but I wanna show you the national trend then. Uh, the Civil Rights Project at UCLA started to look at um, how these policies eventually uh, had really, really stark impact in terms of suspension rates and our students of color compared to white students. So from 1972 all the way to 2012, the top line there is how many, um, how large the suspension rate was for African Americans in this country. That second lighter blue line is the Latino population, the lower line the white population. So we're looking at over time about 16% of those suspension of African Americans had a 16% suspension rate compared to 5% uh, for the white students. So policies do have repercussions and narratives have repercussions. And then here in Minnesota more recently then uh, from the Department of Human Rights we found that although students students of color make up 31% of the student population they are 66% of all suspensions and expulsions. And back to my other slide, you'll see here that having that out-of-school suspension made you more likely to be referred to, uh, to law enforcement. So if there was an in-school suspension, there's about a 4% referral rate. But if you were out-of-school suspensions, there's 92%. So back to that school-to-prison pipeline. And then I always like to end my section with James Baldwin, who is very thoughtful about how this country has to address race and think about um, what we've done in our institutions. 
The great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us and we are unconsciously controlled by it. History is literally present in all that we do. An important reminder to unpack what it is in terms of our policies, our narratives that led us to this point. And um, I think this is important. I kind of conclude based on the disproportionate outcomes and suspension rates in, in and special ed referrals for students of color and American Indian students in the US and Minnesota, we know that race matters. Based on the history of explicit bias, narratives, and policies, and how they've been used to exclude youth of color, we know that race matters. So if we want to create systems of equity and opportunity so that race is no longer a predictor of success or safety or dignity for youth in this country, then we know we must understand race, systemic racism, data, and those practices. As I said earlier, we partnered with um, black scholars and we looked at those, that data that I presented quickly before. Uh, and we have a very important brief in terms of thinking about the history of uh, racism, how they've impacted the, the um, understanding of st students of color and their talents. Uh, there's a term that's very important in the brief called systemic racism, which is how uh, people of color were treated in terms of thinking about ludicrous ideas of underdevelopment of talent, like brain size. You know, and so we have to understand all of that, the systemic racism that's been involved all along in measuring people's talents. Um, and also, uh, the brief shows some recommendations, which, which we'll talk about at the end. But I think this is a very uh, deeper conversation about race as we look at disproportionality in discipline and special education. Uh, it's not just we need teachers with better relationships. We need to understand the history of race and how that created the system that has these outcomes. So with that, I'll ask Rebecca. So um, as my colleague discussed, for the brief that we did, I was one of a couple authors. And the brief looked at um, three main areas. We looked at identification of students in special education. We also looked at discipline as it related to that. And I guess two other areas that we looked at in the brief when we analyzed the data was placement and then restrictive holds. So we looked at identification. We looked at placement, restrictive holds, and discipline. Importantly, the theoretical lens that we use to make sense of how we were interpreting the data was discrete theory. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And discrete theory, the way we interpret it, is it really looks at how race is used as a demarcation to interpretability or disability. And it's important that you understand our theoretical lens and conceptual framework because those are what I say were the eyeglasses that we had to put on to make sense of the data. So because we used um, discrete, which is critical race theory, disability studies, those were the parameters in which we had to use that we were limited to to make sense of the data that we were looking at. And, and our belief is that race is an influence to perception of ability. And so I'm going to say that again, the position that we took based on our conceptual framework and the theoretical frame and the, uh, our theory of discrete was that race is used as an influence of the perception of ability. As Jennifer talked about the history, you have to be cognizant of the history and how in time science was used to justify different levels of intelligence. And that's important because in history, then if we know that and then we look at today what's happening in schools, we continue to have a justification of inability. Do you want to add to this slide? The other reason why history is important is you also need to, to remember the context of education and that here in the United States, it used to be illegal for particularly black people to read. And so this is where I tell my story. I am born here from Minnesota. My father is African American and my mother is white. So growing up, I considered myself black, but as I aged, I uh, identify as a biracial African American because I think that embraces all of who I am. But considering history, and part of my history on my dad's side of the family, my ancestors, some of my ancestors were slaves. My great-grandmother, Becky, was a slave. Why do I say this? 
because we know historically, as black people, we were denied a right to education. If we could read or write, we were hanged. So you have to understand the history. And so if you understand the history of manipulating science or using science to try to, intelli to, try to justify intelligence, and then you also consider historical histories in, tr in terms of socialization and the social implications of it, that kind of should help you understand a context of how we find ourselves in the situation today with the perpetual ongoing existence of disproportionality that we heard Dr. Sullivan talk about. So in the brief, you've heard Jennifer also talk about special education and disproportionality based on our data. And our data was 2017, and we requested it from, from Minnesota Department of Education. And basically what you're looking at here is, this, is, a, is a, um, just a repeat of what you heard Jennifer said, say. That in the state of Minnesota, when we look at our uh, students of color and those who are American Indian, Black students, even though they represent 12% of the school age population, they represent 17% of the students in special ed. And so because there are more students in special education, more black students in special education than they represent in the larger population, we call that disproportionate. And it's an overrepresentation. You can see the same overrepresentation, disproportionate overrepresentation for Hispanic people, and then there's an under-representation for students who identify as Asian. They represent 6.5% of the school population in the state of Minnesota, but yet um, when students who are identified in special ed, you can see here they represent two. So that's an under-representation. And 68% of the students in Minnesota are white, but yet 12% are identified in special education. And remember, there's, there's multiple categories in special education, and this is not talking about the individual categories, it's talking about all the categories together. Because we know when we look at the categories individually, there's going to be different types of over or under representation based within those categories. Again, just a reminder, with the brief, we looked at race um, and discipline disparities. We looked at race and discipline in special education identification placement. That's uh, C, race as an influence in special education seclusion, and then um, holds. And again, our position was that race is an influence for how you're perceived, and race is an influence for how you're treated. And race is an influence, therefore, for the educational experience that you are, are having or inequities that you experience. So when we looked at the data discipline by race, again, his, um, students who identify as Hispanic, 9% of the population is, is uh, disciplined, 38% of students who are disciplined are white, 42% are black, and remember, with the data that you showed previously, black students represent what percent of the population in, in schools in Minnesota? Right, but you hear, you, still, you have an over-representation in discipline at 42. American Indian, Native American, we have 8%, and I think we said they represented 2% of the population in Minnesota. So you can see the trends in terms of how race is an influence for special education and also how race is an influence for the way students are disciplined. Importantly, when we think about discipline and perceptions, there are studies that have been done that indicate that even though students, we'll say black students, may exhibit the same type of behavior as their white counterparts or other students, they still will be disciplined more harshly and more frequently. So black students can do the same thing as everybody else, and they're going to be disciplined more frequently and more harshly. Again, based on the data and our interpretation and the, the glasses that we wear to interpret it, 
we take the position in the brief that race does matter and race is an influence for how students are experiencing school and the treatment that, they, that they're receiving. We looked at race and discipline as an influence for special education again. These are our trends over time. And I'll just give you a minute to look at that. And the point of the trend is just for you to see the consistent um, education inequities that certain groups of, of people experience. It's persistent. Race as an influence for special education seclusion so there's, uh, when you think about the different federal settings and, and also in Minnesota, what's considered the least restrictive environment? What's considered the least restrictive environment in schools? The general education population, right. Yeah. How are you defining the seclusion area then? Yep, so it's, so the way that we define, let me think about that. I think it was the way, it must have been the data that we looked at and how it was reported. Well, I'm, there, there's, I have a, um, just because the data that's reported to the state, they only report a seclusionary event that occurs in a room that is identified as a seclusion room that fits those requirements. So, but I know that things that are happening within our schools, like if they were in classroom and that room were cleared and that student was left in there, that is not considered a secluded right. event, but yet that student is secluded. So then it makes me concerned mm -hmm. that I feel like some of this is happening more frequently than mm -hmm. we're aware of. Absolutely. Um, and thank you for that point and the clarification. So that the, when we say seclusion, what we're referring to in the brief, if my memory serves me correctly, is federal settings. So students who have a disability diagnosis for emotional behavioral disorder, EBD, they account for more than half of all students experiencing restrictive procedures. This has a significant impact on students of color and American Indian students who continue to be diagnosed with having an emotional behavioral disorder at a higher rate. And again, just take a minute to look at that. Um, we see um, students that are in, of the different special education classifications and looking at students who are labeled EBD having an emotional behavioral disorder. And so does, is there anyone in the room who um, can say in their own words their interpretation of EBD and what that means? Anybody care to? I say in my classes, speak into the silence. <laughs> so very simply, the way that I consider emotional behavioral disorder, which is an ugly name, is that it's behavior that interferes with learning. It's not that students have an inability to learn. I think we can read that someplace in Minnesota in a definition of EBD. But it's not that students have an inability to learn. It's that behavior interferes with learning. And so when we look at the different classifications, 55% of students who have behavior that interferes with learning are placed in restrictive settings. So that means they're removed from the general education uh, classroom. 25%, according to the data that we looked at, are students who have autism, and you talked about that. Did, um, in Dr. Sullivan's speech, did she get into um, settings or anything like that? Okay. So 25% of students who are diagnosed with autism are in restrictive settings. Other disabilities are 8%, and then you can just see um, some of the lower incidents. Race as an influence for disciplinary physical holds. So now if it's not enough to seclude students by removing them from the classroom, denying them their right to interact with students their peers, if that's not enough, we have to then physically hold students. So when we look at physical restraints, manual restraints of students, American Indian students who account for approximately 3% of special education population are also overrepresented in physical holds. So we look at physical holds 2015 to 16, 
4%. Hispanic students, 5%. Black students, 32. What was the percent that uh, students, black students represent in the uh, school population here in Minnesota? 12. What percent of those students are experiencing physical holds in school? 32%. Even when we just talk about that, just a minute in terms of the difference. So you have a risk ratio index. So here in Minnesota, the risk ratio used to be four, and it was lowered to three. And what that risk ratio means is, as a state, we have agreed, and we are okay, that students of color have a 3% more chance of being labeled as having special needs. So that means depending on your skin color, for depending on where you live, if you're here in Minnesota, we're saying that if you are a person of color, we're comfortable with you having a 3% more likelihood of being placed in special education just because of your race. You can't do anything about that, but yet we feel that's acceptable. Questions on that? Do you want to talk about the policy brief or recommendations? Let me go back. Um, when we talk about race as an influence, and then when I talked about the uh, risk ratio, I want to give you an example of how this shows up. So Carla Monroe did a study and she looked at how teachers perceive students, particularly black male students, how, they, how teachers perceive their movement styles. And she reported that teachers interpreted the movement styles of black boys to suggest that they were low achieving, that they were aggressive, that they'd be insubordinate, and that their intellect would be lower just by the way they moved. So again, the policy brief, our parameters, our glasses that we use to make sense of the data was that race is an influence for ability. So if we believe that race is an influence for, for ability and we look at other studies like Carla Monroe's study that, in, that shares teachers' perceptions of students and how teachers perceive black boys or black students movement styles to be lower achieving, this is what that means. It means that as a classroom teacher, all your students come in. Let's use our imagination. All the students are coming in and having a seat. If I'm a black boy and I walk in the classroom just like everybody else, sit down at my desk, I have a 3% more chance of being identified in special education, and I've already been looked at and perceived to be a behavior problem, to be less intelligent, to be insubordinate. All I did was walk in the classroom like everybody else and sit down and didn't say a word. That's an example of how race is an influence for ability or disability. Does that make sense? And I'm not making this up. I mean, we look at the literature, we look at, at our statistics here in Minnesota, it's not a pleasant experience for some of our students. That, going to the that's what I was hoping you would do before yeah, I got I up. <laughs> All right, policy <laughs> recommendations. She's very good about that. Um, Rebecca has worked with a lot of students in different levels. I tend to work with policymakers or advocates, so it's just like two different things. But we got to put it all together. So if you look at the brief, um, and, and then we want to have a discussion with you all, we have these recommendations that, if you unpack them, have a lot of uh, systemic um, uh, consequences, and uh, you can go deep on each one, is, is my point. The first is that we, we want to require implicit bias training that actually utilizes a critical race theory framework for both school personnel in general and special education. 
So that's something that, that we we're pushing for and we will have a policy agenda in the, this spring and the coming year as well around that. We want to review the statewide assessment criteria for identification of students in that EBD category. Because I think the most starking, th starking thing in that data point is that African Americans are 12% of our state population. And then they're overly uh, referred to special education. 55% of those in special education are identified as EBD and almost 20% of our EBD students in the state of Minnesota, almost 20% are African American. Now, I would guess the gender of male. That is deeply problematic, and it's a broad category. Um, I wanted to jump in about what I think about EBD, but I'll leave my, uh, it's just this kind of catch-all, right? It's, it's a catch-all. And then third, we want to expand positive, um, there, are, there are attempts in terms of PBIS, behavioral interventions that are supporting uh, classrooms. But again, that critical race theory is super important and to, if I, to add to that. It is, sorry to, um, to cut you off. And the reason why we add the critical theory framework is because we know research shows that even though PBIS can be effective, when you really um, examine the data, where it's most effective is with white students. You still see, you don't really see a lot of change in behaviors of black students. So that's why we have to add that component of uh, critical race. Okay. Um, can you speak to this, the collaboration between M, the Minnesota Department of Education, I think? Yep, so here uh, a recommendation is for there to be um, strengthened or developed collaborations between different entities. That would be like a, a school, community partnership, and then the different agencies among the state. Within Minnesota, if uh, schools are not making adequate progress, they have to report that and make a plan to the state, to the Minnesota Department of Education. And we know recently, or last year, we know that the Minnesota Department of Human Rights entered into contracts with 40, 40, yeah, 42 ish districts around the state. And so those contracts tended to be around disproportionality. And so, but what I found in some of my research was not all the state agencies are talking. If a district was cited for disproportionality by MDE, Minnesota Department of Education, and they also are in an agreement with the Minnesota Department of Human Rights, the two plans aren't necessarily connected. And so we have to start having, agent, our state agencies have to work more collaboratively to better strengthen school districts in an effort to increase and improve the educational experiences for students. So that's kind of what I mean. And the last point, uh, too, is, and, and again, this is related to, this was time sensitive, so I'll just update you. Um, there were Obama-era regulations around school districts addressing this issue, so you're all familiar. And then after the 2016 election, those were put on hold. Um, so we want to go back to those Obama regulations. States can still adopt them and push, put, put forward um, that guidance to those districts. So with MDHR and MDE's leadership on addressing those issues, that is showing that our state is trying to lead on that, um, attempting to make those steps. But it'll be very critical what those agreements look like and how MDE comes back and says, no, you need to actually follow through with some of these next steps. So I think with that, I mean, I will just conclude that this is an issue around systems, structures, and cultures. That's what we say about um, an EAP. There is no silver bullet, right? But um, there have been other huge areas of our, our uh, education ecosystem that have been deeply invested in with system structures, and cultures. I'll name one key one, early childhood. Early childhood got foundations together, got businesses to together to talk about why all day kindergarten, so many children need that early development. And so I think uh, there's so many examples when we put our minds together, when we advocate with one another, our neighbors. Um, I talk about this at Thanksgiving, okay? We've got to just start to break this myth of certain children are more misbehaved than other children. Uh, we have to talk about the brilliance. You know, when there is black brilliance, talk about it. You know, the chemists, the, the doctors, the teachers, um, your, your local neighbor that just is really, are really there to show shining examples of all of our talents from all the different cultural backgrounds. That's very important. If anything else you leave with today, uh, you, you can go to a hearing and we'll let you know about the hearings, but let's just shift our conversations in our communities about the talents and the importance of centering communities of color and American Indian students through our community uh, learning processes in our ecosystem.
Thank you very much.